So we're very happy to start the third and last day of our workshop on generative AI. And our first speaker is Dreg Shaknarovich, sorry about that, who's at TTIC up in Chicago. Uh, TTIC is the Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago, and it's part of uh, its foundation paid for um, university that specializes in AI. And it's, he's also a part of the University of Chicago Department of Computer Science. He leads the Perceptron, Perception and Learning Systems Group at TTIC. Prior to going to TTIC, he was a postdoc at Brown University working with Michael Black. He did his PhD at MIT in CSAIL with Trevor Durrell. And he is originally from Israel, uh, where he worked both at uh, Haifa at the Technion at Hebrew University. His research interests include image understanding, standard tasks like object detection, and novel definitions of scene parsing and understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, you see the other logo here. I'm uh, on sabbaticals this year at TRI, Toyota Research Institute. Confusingly, despite the name Toyota in both of them, they're completely unrelated to each other. Uh, TRI is an actual Toyota Research Lab. Um, where uh, people work on uh, all kinds of things related to machine learning, computer vision, robotics, NLP. So if you're interested, I can tell you more offline. Um, all right, so um, I am going to talk about lifting 2D image models to 3D. Um, there has been a lot of talk about uh, what, it, what 2D models do to produce images. Uh, the task I'm interested in here is taking text describing an object of some sort or a scene and producing a 3D model of that scene. I will define a little bit more in a moment what I mean by 3D model. So for example, if you want to see a 3D model of a squirrel dressed like um, Henry VIII, you, um, you might uh, get something like this. These are four different outputs uh, that you get. Of course, it's, it immediately tells us that maybe we want to have some kind of diversity, try a few different models and pick one we like. Um, so for now, and generally for this talk, and I think for most of the work that people are doing in this area, uh, what, when I say scene, I really mean basically a single object. Uh, of course, the definitions are a little iffy, but you can imagine that it's a, what, what the object might mean here. Um, for real scenes, which are, consist of multiple objects interacting in some complicated way, um, it's a little bit out of reach for the models we are working on, although already probably we have some paths to make, create scenes by making a bunch of objects and then composing them. But for the purpose of the talk, you can just think of a single uh, well-defined object, possibly a complex one like this uh, medieval squirrel. Um, so um, why is it an interesting problem? Why should anyone care? And why is it difficult? Because if it's interesting but not difficult, then we are done. So uh, there are multiple applications here. Uh, there are some kind of obvious applications, uh, such as generating assets for gaming, for virtual reality, for augmented reality. Um, I also think that from a more kind of scientific standpoint, uh, being able to create 3D models from, uh, from text might give us uh, some kind of better handle on understanding how image models that we're using in such approaches I'll describe capture 3D or are aware of 3D. Um, and I think it also possibly is a bridge to 3D perception. So I'm a computer vision person, so it's a relatively new thing for me to spend so much time generating um, cute-looking images, but I think it might be a gateway to understand better how we can perceive images, and one I will show towards the end of the talk, actually, one application of the stuff we are doing, which allows us to, uh, to move from pure kind of hallucination, right? When we're generating the squirrel, clearly it does not, is not an object that actually exists, to more traditional 3D tasks in computer vision, like reconstruction. If I tell, give you a single image of, of an object, can you, you still have to hallucinate what's behind what, what is unseen, but it's conditioned on the actual thing that is, exists in the real world in the photograph. Um, so uh, why, is it, why is it difficult? Um, so in general, when you, if you try to take image models and use them to generate 3D stuff, the main issue, and we will, we will see uh, how it comes up in, uh, in the couple of methods I'll describe, is consistency. So it's easy to generate a bunch of pictures of a squirrel, right? Various diffusion models, for example, that are very uh, popular now, and you, you have seen the previous two days, 
you can use them to generate pictures of squirrels. The problem is to generate multiple pictures of the same squirrel from different viewpoints. Uh, so that that's, turns out to be pretty tricky. Uh, a very common issue which comes up when people try to do this is a so-called Janus problem. So Janus, of course, is uh, the uh, mythological figure in Greek, Greek mythology where, who has two faces. Um, it often is used to refer to uh, duplicitous people or, or, or something like this. But uh, in the cases of some of these models, it's quite literally the problem of the resulting model having multiple faces. So if you look at the squirrel, it's not a great looking squirrel, but maybe look okay. But if you start running around this model, you'll see that actually it's, the squirrel has, in this case, I think three faces, really. Um, and that's a problem because this, the underlying image models are not really, do not talk to each other when they generate different views and kind of impose different views, and it's not clear how to avoid it. So that's another big challenge. Uh, and of course, for anything we do here, we want to make sure that we can uh, have really open world kind of vocabulary. We, we want to generate, ideally, any kind of thing we might want, uh, and not just specific categories. And we ideally would like to have some diversity, being able to generate multiple different possible objects for the same prompt. So, um, so uh, what, what do I mean by 3D objects? So for the purpose of this talk, at least, when I talk about 3D object, a 3D asset to kind of make it a little bit less tied to one object, um, you can think of it as some kind of mathematical object which allows us to render views of the desired 3D thing from arbitrary viewpoints. And um, like most people today in computer vision, the way we will represent this 3D object is through uh, an implicit model, uh, um, also known as a radiance field. So I will briefly describe what this means if you are not familiar. Uh, the most common term that you may have heard in this context is NERF, neural radiance fields. Um, there is a big variety of models, which some of them are really NERF, some of them uh, are quite different from original, originally proposed NERFs, but they all share this general idea of interacting with a rendering uh, process, interacting with the representation of a 3D scene through a radiance field. So the field is a function which maps a 3D point, let me use it here, um, maps a 3D point, x, y, z, and the two numbers describing the direction from which you are looking at 3D point, right? You just need two numbers to describe orientation in 3D. There is some function which represents this radiance field, and the output of that function is the RGB color that you might see if you look from that direction uh, at that point. And this value is sigma, which you can think of as, roughly speaking, transparency or light, light transport number, which tells you how opaque that point is. So uh, if you can apply this function at any point in space, that allows you to render an image by taking a particular pixel seen by a camera at the desired pose, taking a ray by going through that pixel, taking a whole bunch of points, maybe you know, 100 or 200 points along the ray, Computing for each of those points what you would, what color RGB you would see at that point if you observe it from the direction of the camera with a certain transparency and then integrating over that um, using the volumetric rendering equation. And that gives you eventually the RGB color that you would see by preponderance of all of those RGB values and sigma values along the ray. That gives you the color of this pixel. If you do it for every pixel, each pixel has a slightly different ray direction, of course, you will get an image. So that's how you render from a radiance field. Um, and um, this, this, uh, this approach has seen a lot, a major resurgence in the last, I would say, four years maybe at this point, three to four years. Although the general idea of representing 3D world this way is pretty old. It goes back to at least 1991. There's a paper, uh, the proposal to use so-called planoptic function, which is actually like this, but it also includes a couple other things, like time. So it basically tells you how anything is seen from anywhere at any point. Um, and of course, the modern tools, like this function, which maps x, y, z, theta, phi to an RGB color today is some kind of neural network, which can be trained a large amount of data. And that, of, as with many other things, that turns out gives us the possibility to actually use some of the old ideas in a much more powerful way. Um, there are lots and lots of different modifications and variations of what this function looks like. 
I'm not really get, going to get into that. I think that's kind of uh, below the level of detail we should care about. I will say how you train any kind of any radiance fields generally. It's trained using photometric laws. What does it mean? It, you have your current function, which represents right, through this map, radiance field mapping what your scene is like. You, uh, you take an arbitrary viewpoint for which you actually have, you know what the real image is. So this requires having images with known poses of, your, of the thing you're modeling. And you say, well, under my current function f, I can render the image as I think it is, and I can see what the, what the color of every pixel is. Then you compare it to the color of the actual pixel in the image, and you compute the squared loss. And then since the function is differentiable, you back, and the volumetric rendering equation is differentiable, you back propagate through the whole thing, and you update your function. And you can do it for the, all the pixels of one image or some of the pixels from multiple images at once. So this is kind of all, uh, it, it's, it's really kind of, you can break it down into individual pixels. So um, the original NERF paper, uh, which kind of revisited this and proposed a modern solution to this in, I think, 2020, uh, had a method which took 14 hours to learn a single such, uh, such model. Today we are down to seconds, not surprisingly, like with everything else. And so, um, so this is kind of the general approach to modeling 3D scenes. So what we want when we are talking about text to 3D, we would like to take a text from describing the squirrel wearing King Henry VIII's uh, clothes and get out some kind of nerve which allows us then to inter interact and render uh, and insert the squirrel in another environment, et cetera. All right, so, uh, so I'm going to talk about two pieces of work which approach this problem slightly differently or significantly differently. Um, so this is all uh, work uh, with my students, Hao Chen Wang, Zhao Li, Xiao Dan Du, and uh, with Raymond Ye, who actually was, uh, until relatively recently, a PhD student here, uh, then was a research faculty at uh, TTIC, and has now moved on to Purdue as, as a professor. Um, so the first part, um, called score recovery chaining, is going to be an idea to use image models, image generative models, like diffusion, or another, in our case, um, and use it to essentially provide a training signal that helps training, optimizing a nerve for a given scene. So the trick there is that you are generating something for which you don't have images. And so the idea is that diffusion model can help you generate the images. Um, but, uh, but there are some non-trivial issues that we have to deal with that to actually apply this idea. I will, I will, I will explain shortly. And then the second part called instance 3D, which is misspelled here, is um, using image models in a very different way. It uses image models to kind of generate a set of images from which we could then immediately produce a nerve, but in a way which is much faster than this kind of volumetric, uh, photometric loss-based training, and, and I will again explain that. Um, okay, so why, first maybe let's, let's figure out, why can't we just say, well, it, the diffusion models and maybe some other models, but certainly diffusion models have been very successful for image generation. Why don't we just figure out how to use them to generate 3D shapes? In fact, you can do that. This, this uh, uh, pictures uh, might look familiar to you, I believe, right? If you paid attention to Alex's talk the other day, uh, you can do that and it works pretty well, but under some major assumptions. So I believe Alex's work uh, showed this for shapes for which we have a pretty decent data set, ShapeNet, I believe, right? And so these are both kind of fairly constrained. So there is a variety of different tables, but they're all kind of tables in the end. There's no stuff on the tables. Um, I should also say that this is purely for shape and not for shape and texture, which we would really like, right? You, the squirrel we saw before was wearing different colors, red and gold crown and whatnot. But also I think you really need to have a substantial amount of data, as far as we know for now, for a particular kind of thing they are generating. We would like to have a much more open-ended generation. Um, so, so for now, it's kind of unclear how you can use diffusion model directly to just train it to generate 3D. Um, and so we have a lot less data for than 2D, but we do have all of that image data. And so maybe we can leverage image generators to actually help us in this task. So, um, uh, in score Jacobian chaining, we take the view of diffusion models as score matching models. And I think this also has been said already a couple of times in previous talk, but just to make sure we are on the same page. So um, a diffusion 
model tries to kind of give you an ability to sample from this P of X. X is an image. P of X is a real distribution of images. Uh, usually it's conditional on something like the prompt. I'm not going to write that because it's, I think, assumed. Um, and what we are dealing with is noisy images. So you get the images by taking the original one, adding Gaussian noise n, multi-scaled by some sigma, which basically tells you how much noise you are adding. Uh, and the noisy distribution is P sigma. So this is after you added the noise, this variance sigma, starting deviation sigma. Uh, and so what we do in a diffusion model, we train a network, this epsilon hat, which uh, was applied to images. And that network essentially tells you where to go if you are given a noisy image. And this network, again, I'm not writing it explicitly, but the network knows how much noise you are given, you are, you, how much noise is supposed to have affected this noisy X. And it tells you where to go from this image, noisy image, so that you can come closer to the original un clean image, which is why it is a denoising network. And um, so the denoiser that is, is, uses this network epsilon is take, makes a step, right? So you make the step, you multiply it by sigma because that's the right. So theoretically, if this would, it would be exactly right and you made a step of size sigma, you would get exactly back the original image. In practice, of course, you have to make a small step in that direction and then re-estimate epsilon hat on the slightly less noisy image, and that's how denoising works. Um, and so you can show that, um, that this equation here, which is basically the scale difference between your denoising uh, step and, and the image, is an approximation, really this should be approximately equal, approximation of the score of the noisy distribution. And the score is the gradient of the distribution with respect to the input. Right, just kind of to avoid confusion, people often the usual gradient we think of of a distribution with respect to the in, uh, in machine learning is the gradient with respect to the parameters of the distribution. So score is the gradient with respect to the input. It tells you how to change the data so that your, your probability function would have a higher probability value. Um, so you can think of it as also a mode-seeking uh, process. And in our CVPR papers, there's a pretty nitty-gritty discussion about the connection, but I will not get into that right now. So this is the score matching interpretation of diffusion models. Um, I, I want, there won't be too much mass. I think this is more or less all the mass there is, so please do not fall asleep yet. Uh, but we just to kind of tell you a little bit why this mass is here, so, um, so, so we are in the business of trying to generate a 3D model theta, right? So we assume that there is some distribution. So this is the distribution of squirrels wearing King's clothes, P of theta. Again, everything conditioned on the, on, implicitly on the prompt. Um, if we render this thing with, from a particular pose pi, this is where we are the camera pose, then we will get an image. Now, um, it's, so we don't know how to directly reason about probability of this 3D thing, but what we can reason about is the probability of the 2D images, right, through the diffusion model. In fact, what we can say is that if we add noise to the probability distribution, to, to, to the, add noise to the view of the 3D thing that we rendered, this P sigma of X pi. So X pi of theta, again, is the view of the object theta from point, viewpoint pi. Then uh, if we consider all possible views from all possible directions and take the expectation, then you can show that the, rather, it's really an assumption that the probability of the 3D object is kind of proportional to the probability of the views of this object. Because the only thing we know about 3D objects in this framework is what they look like. So the idea here is you want to have a high probability 3D object, you need to make sure that its views from any viewpoint are, have high probability. So that suggests that if you start with some random object, which will produce some bad views, you can start treating them as noisy observations and start denoising them. And by the denoising the, the views, you will hopefully be denoising the 3D object. And with a little bit of, uh, of mass, which I will thankfully not, get, not, not go into right now, but you can read it in our CVPR 23 paper, uh, you can show that the lower, that you can represent the tight, fairly tight lower bound on, on this quantity. Uh, as a product, as an expectation of a, of a product of the score with respect to noisy images of, that you render, and this we know how to do, that's a diffusion model. We already, if you have a trained diffusion model for images, then that model gives you this 
ability to estimate the score times the Jacobian of the renderer, which is actually not very scary despite what it looks like and could be computed very efficiently. And everything is differentiable in, in the radiance field. If data are parameters of a radiance field, you can go back and forth to render the image and then from the image back to, to the 3D. So just to kind of uh, clarify how this works, again, you start with some random parameters of a NERF, of 3D model of some sort. You take a random view, you render it, you will kind of get some kind of garbage initially, but then a diffusion model will tell you, oh, you want this to look like an image of a squirrel in King's Close, well, if you want to make it more like an image of a squirrel in King's Close, this is, some, uh, this is the estimate for where you need to go. Now, you can't just change the image like in a typical diffusion model because the image doesn't exist by itself. It's a rendering of a 3D thing. So the image then tells the renderer, oh, the diffusion model, model wants me to change my pixels in this way. The renderer tells the 3D model, I want these pixels to be more orange and these pixels to be more green, and so the 3D model updates its parameters so that if you render it again, it will be closer to that. So you get a slight update to the, to the nerve, to the 3D model, then you take another ran, uh, random view, render it again, and proceed in this way until you have some, something which looks nice, hopefully. Let me pause for a second and see if there are questions. So that's really the key idea. Um, now, one major issue here, which we discovered, is that if you just do it as I described, things don't really work. And the reason they don't work is that the diffusion model, when you train it, it really is used to certain things matching its expectations. So if you tell it that this is a noisy image with a certain amount of noise, it trains to kind of help you to move to a less noisy image, but only if the noise assumptions match what it expects. In particular, it really has to be an image which kind of an expectation has Gaussian noise with certain sigma. So if you want to play, if you have access to some diffusion model code, you can see what happens if you give it the noisy image, which is in fact Gaussian noise, but with the wrong sigma, which doesn't match the expectation. You will see that things don't quite work. Uh, and here the situation is even worse, because the noise that appears in the image as a result of rendering noisy 3D model is really not a Gaussian noise. So it has all kinds of structure. So the problem is an out-of-distribution problem, OOD, right? The, the, the things you are feeding to a trained diffusion model are not what it is used to seeing. And again, I want to stop for a second and clarify that there is no training of a diffusion model here. A diffusion model is, exists, uh, it's already trained. It just tells you, it knows how to make images better, and that's how you use it. So, how, so this is kind of an illustration of this. If you take a diffusion model trained to generate faces, and you give it the initial canvas, which looks like this it's kind of zero canvas with an orange blob in the middle, and you simply naively try to use it, the diffusion model, to produce a face, it'll produce something which generally looks like a face, but it has this big blob in the middle, because it, the, this blob really is, doesn't match what it's used to seeing, and so it doesn't quite know how to handle it. So it retains, it changes the color, but in the end the blob is still there. If, it, if instead you first perturb the image, so every time you kind of are, you take the blob image, you add some noise and then try to denoise it, you get something which looks a little bit better. It's not a great face, but at least, and you can see kind of the effect of the orange blob which makes this big bulbous nose here, but it actually at least looks more like a real face. And so the intuition here is what we actually kind of related to what we end up doing. Uh, the idea uh, that we use is that we, instead of simply taking our current rendered image and de uh, denoising it, we first add additional noise to it, and we do it a few times, and so this is our current uh, rendered view of a 3D object, which is assumed to be a noisy view of a real thing. We add multiple possible noises, so in this picture there are three different noise signals, N1, N2, and N3, with, for, with a sigma variance. And for each of those, we say maybe that, should, that image is actually closer to be like a real noisy image. And then we um, evaluate what the denoising network wants to do with it. So we get from the three noisy perturbations of our render view, we get three different points. And then we actually average them to get the actual result that we say that, that direction that, that averages over the brown lines, which go from the our current view to what the denoising things for each of the perturbed versions. We average those brown lines, and that gives us a single direction as we move in that direction. And that produces much better results. And again, I, I will refer you to the paper for details, but hopefully this gives you the gist. Um, so um, 
And I apologize for somewhat glitchy videos, but these are, I think, maybe for the best with the quality of the 3D models we get, but they're actually not bad. Um, so this is using uh, diffusion, uh, just the st stable diffusion, not stable diffusion Excel, the original stable diffusion. And I'm not showing the prompts, but you can figure kind of what they are, a ficus tree and a uh, burger car and whatnot. Um, so, um, okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe I will not try my luck too much. And, uh, the toy tank here. Uh, so, so one interesting thing with the tank, you will see, if you look carefully, you'll see that the wheels on two different sides are different. Um, so there is not that much consistency there yet. But uh, on the other hand, there is no Janus problem here. You don't have the tank having you know, cannons pointing in different directions. Um, and you can say, how is it possible that there is consistency here? And the consistency is because the 3D model is shared by all of the render views. So it's possible that in an independently different views would want to have totally unrelated pictures of you know, this tree or this duck or the, or the ficus, but there is, it's much more difficult for a 3D model like NERF to accommodate all of these unrelated views seen from different directions. And so this inherent smoothness of a 3D radiance field makes this thing much more compact and 3D consistent. Um, so, uh, so the results, uh, this was a, Things are moving very fast. This was one of the first papers that actually produced this kind of consistent, uh, 3D consistent results using pre-trained diffusion models. There has been some, a bunch of follow-up work since then, which has improved it further. Um, there is, it's one major issue with this work is it's difficult to get really diverse scenes because it's, it turns out that for a given prompt, diffusion model basically has a particular image that it really prefers to see. If you sample from it independently, it will kind of, may be able to produce other images. But if you really want all of the views to be consistent, it tends to produce kind of more or less one kind of toy tank here, one kind of duck, and it's very difficult to force it to do more diverse output. So, um, so this is score Jacobian chaining. Um, I'm going to now switch to the second work, which is very uh, new. Uh, it's under review, uh, although you can find it uh, on, uh, uh, on open review. Um, and uh, this is work by uh, my student Jahao and colleagues at Adobe during his internship there. So um, this is going back to the idea of relating, re hallucinating 3D stuff and reconstructing 3D stuff. And uh, again, in some ways, this goes back to much earlier work, right? People have thought about ways to take a few views of a scene, sparse set of views, possibly as few as four in this case, and reconstruct the 3D object. Uh, one piece of work which was very famous for, for a long time in graphics was visual hulls. The idea was that you look at the silhouettes of your, uh, of your object, like these four pictures of a person uh, from different viewpoints. You kind of intersect them in, in space. You carve out the space using this intersection. You get a 3D convex hull, essentially, of uh, not con it's, a, it's a 3D hull. It's not convex hull because obviously there are holes here. But the intersection gives you a solid 3D uh, object, you can then render it by reprojecting uh, and uh, interpolating the colors that you see for each point on that surface. Um, and this allows you to potentially render this from novel viewpoints and insert it into environment. You will see that this has kind of this quality of what you would expect from computer graphics since 2000 in an academic environment. This is not exact, it's, it's not the kind of 3D models we would expect we want today. Um, and of course, this doesn't tell us how to generate 3D models. It only tells us how to reconstruct stuff from actual pictures. So um, now one reason that I think this, the quality here for reconstruction was not, very, not that great is that at the time, there was no kind of learning here, no prior, which you need if you only have a few views. You really kind of need to figure out what would be the other views that you don't see. And today, we have tools which might allow us to do this better, such as NERF, which allows us to kind of interpolate between pixels that we see and pixels that we haven't seen. And um, data-driven models, such as maybe diffusion models or other image generators, that, that allow us to reason about quality of the images. And also, maybe we can kind of leverage what we have seen in other scenes when we generate a nerve for this scene by learning some kind of prior over the nerves. And how do we do that? By training a model to actually generate the nerve. And so that's... Um, that's actually what we are going to do here. So the first piece of, of, the, of the puzzle here 
is how to take a few views and using modern qu high quality techniques get a 3D model. So this is a car made of sushi. Let's say you have four views of this car. And for a moment, just imagine that someone actually made a car out of sushi and took four photographs at 90 degree angles, right? Now, it turns out that you can actually train a transformer, and I'm not going to get into any of the details there in the open review paper, but you can train a transformer which takes this sparse set of four views and produces a pretty high quality representation of the nerve. And we use a triplanar model if you really want to know nitty gritty, but it's, you can think of it as the nerve like in that slide, just the radiance field. Um, you train this transformer on a data set of synthetic images. Since you have synthetic images, you have 750,000, and now I think there's a bigger version of the data set, uh, 750,000 of synthetic objects for which you can render any set of views. So you can just render sets of four orthogonal views for the 750,000 objects, and you train a model which takes this four tuple views and gets you a nerve that correctly generates And the training of this model is still like training a nerve with photometric loss, but you have one more stage here, right? So you get the views, your transformer tells you the nerve, you take this nerve, you render one arbitrary view, which you know what it should look like because you actually have the real 3D object. You compare the pixels, you backpropagate from the pixels to the nerve. The nerve backpropagates through the transformer saying, I want to, to be this nerve which is better. And transformer says, okay, in, next time you, know, you are you see these images, you will be a better nerve for the scene. And if you train it uh, on the 750,000 objects, you get a pretty good nerve generator. So that's good. Um, the problem is how do you get the images? So first attempt again to just, well, run a diffusion model four times, but there are three problems here. A, you need to really be able to control the views. If you want the views to always be 90 degrees apart, it turns out that it's highly non-trivial. You can try to tell stable diffusion from the left, from the right, but it doesn't always listen. Uh, it's not very disciplined. And it's often unclear. What is the ref left front and, no, you, for this bear. You know, if the bear was standing like this, maybe. But the bear is dancing ballet in this case, supposedly. You immediately see the second problem. They're all different bears with different clothes. And one of them doesn't have clothes at all. And um, in different poses, so they're inconsistent. And finally, you have also this kind of background, and this, for, for some reason, it really likes to put this possibly snow or stars, I don't know what it is, but not always. And so that complicates the situation, right? And the picture I showed you here, the background was very neat and white, and that's what you want, because you want to just focus on the object you're generating. So, um, so how do you deal with this, um, right? This a car made of sushi, it's an actual thing I, I ran last night with Stable Diffusion Excel, and you get this, and I picked four of them, but you know, they're all very uh, enticing, but all of them are very different. So, so the solution is, turns out, to generate them all at once. So instead of just generating four views, why don't you try to use a diffusion to simultaneously generate the four views? How do you do that? You fine-tune a diffusion model to generate images which look like this, which look like four orthogonal views of the same object. And it turns out that the diffusion model in principle is already almost there. You just need to fine-tune it with a very light uh, weight fine-tuning. So you have to kind of give it examples of these four tuples where the, the top, no, the view on the left is from certain views, and the view here is 90 degrees, the view here is 270 degrees, the view here is whatever, uh, 360, 180, 270 degrees, 360 would not help us. So, um, and you also need to somehow encourage it to avoid clutter. Um, so how do you do that? First, uh, it turns out that you only need 10,000 examples to do this, if you, and you can get them by trying to pick high quality examples from that synthetic objectverse data set. Uh, I won't get too much into the details, but basically um, there, is a, uh, um, there are 2,000 uh, examples which were manually labeled as good or bad, so, and they, this is not well defined, but it seems like kind of if you, a couple of people look at it, they usually agree. So the bad ones are the ones which are kind of not photorealistic, not high quality, not, and not interesting. The good ones are good ones, are photorealistic, more interesting textures, uh, higher quality meshes. Uh, and if, after you label a couple thousand of, of views manually, you can then train a classifier. You know, there's gasping here, it's an SVM classifier on top of some clip features, like images. Um, so, 
if you do that and then you select the 10,000 3D models, which seem to be the highest score under the classifier, that produces much better results than if you train on the entire 750,000, which I guess reinforces this general idea that maybe high quality, fine tuning on small high quality data set is promising. Um, and then you take this, this views, you produce better, so the Objiverse data set has captions, those captions are sometimes weird, so instead uh, we recaption those views with blip2, which is a, kind of one of the standard uh, commonly used captioning methods right now, which seems to work pretty well. And then we take this 10,000 examples, and again, I want to emphasize, it's only 10,000, so everybody can do it, as long as you have a few GPUs. Um, and we fine tune the, uh, fine -tune the model. Um, it's a little bit like instruction tuning for LLM, if you want to think about it, right? This is a diffusion model, which you are trying to do it something very specific, but not quite different from what it, I mean, it, it is an image after all, and it probably has seen some images like this, but not, you know, not a lot, and you just want to tell it that that's the thing I want you to focus on now, and so lightweight fine-tuning seems to work. Um, I am starting to be a little tight on time, so I'm going to skip the details, but it turns out that it does help to do this. Uh, it's better than if you train on the entire un uncurated data set, um, and, um, and another thing which helps is if you initialize your, when you do inference, instead of just a kind of clear canvas, you initialize it with this Gaussian blobs for each of the four views. That tends to produce much less cluttered images that you see at the bottom here uh, compared to what you see here. And, and these images, of course, are much easier to use in this transformer, which was trained on clean, uncluttered images to produce a nerve. So the whole thing is, at inference time, you initialize your canvas with this Gaussian blobs. You run your fine-tuned diffusion model with a prompt that you want to generate these four views, and then you feed them into a transformer which already knows how to take these four views as if they were actual views of a real thing and generate a nerve. Um, so, so this is, I just want to con contrast this to the previous work I was talking about. And that work, there was no training for the task of generating 3D, but there is a lot of test time optimization, right? You have to actually optimize the 3D, the, the nerve for your scene by interacting with diffusion models many times. So that can take 10, 20 minutes for, for a, to generate an object. Here, the inference is very quick, right? There, you initialize, you run a single pass through the, you know, whatever, however, 50 epochs or 50 steps or so, whatever, for diffusion model to generate this. Then you feed it through a transformer, generate the thing, that's it. So the whole thing here takes to generate a pretty high quality 3D model takes less than 20 seconds. So you know, instant is of course a matter of uh, definition, but I would say it's more instant than 20 minutes. So, um, all right, so some, some comparisons. I will, uh, while this is maybe showing, is there any questions about the method? Yes. Shall I? Oh, is there a mic or I guess they're not? Sorry, I'm ambushed. Them. Them. There is a question here. There's some more results. Thank you. Um, thanks, Greg. This is really interesting work. So, two questions. Did you look at different nerve representations besides triplanes, and do they matter? And second question, you had the slide where you were doing the instruction, sort of instruction fine tuning for this 3D reconstruction task, and you had a labeling stage of good versus bad. What was the intuition behind that? Um, uh, uh, mostly, so, so if you look at Objiverse, just uh, you will see that there is, I, I, I'm not saying that there is some real dichotomy of two classes, but you can kind of, you see that there are not very good models which are not kind of flat, non-photorealistic texturing. Like look at, look at that. That's not, there's no interesting color or texture there and we want something which is textured. We don't have like a separate mechanism to add, to add texture. Um, some models are just very uninteresting, like this flat monitor. I mean, it's a valid model, but it's just not something which is interesting. So you can think of it as a subjective measure, which whoever labeled it imposed. Um, it's, in the papers, there are, there are ablations for how much it matters, and it does matter quite a bit. So it seems like it's doing something, something useful. I don't think I have a more precise definition other than that. But the intuition is primarily looking for 
higher quality, what you would consider to be a higher quality model, perhaps, but it's, as I said, it's somewhat subjective. Uh, as far as the triplanner, um, I do not have anything which would allow me to say with confidence. My personal hunch is probably does not matter. Triplanner model, you know, I like them personally, and you know, Jahal likes them, they're, they're convenient to work with, but I don't think it matters. Thanks. Okay. All right, so um, let me show you. I, I am pretty much done. I'm just going to show you a few results, but maybe I will say one more thing about this before I take more questions. So this is what happens if you actually use the same idea to do reconstruction from a single view. So this is a view generated, in this case, uh, by, by a diffusion model by itself. And what you do here is you, you have to fine tune the diffusion model for this task a little bit differently. And the difference is that for this task, when you give it this grid of four views, one of them always remains clean. So you noise the other three. And then when you do the inference, you actually run it like this. You give it a single view. Uh, the other three are Gaussian blobs. And then you do the inference, and it produces this uh, 3D models for the rest of the, of the thing. Um, all right, Qu uh, questions? Alex. Um, or David, maybe? Okay, David has a microphone, sorry. Yes. Ah, ah, well, there, there you go, you see. Uh, um, so a distinctive feature of large-scale NERFs is floaters. And there's sort of various hacks you can do to get them under control and the like. And what I'm noticing is the procedure you're producing is producing NERFs that don't have floaters. In, in this work? Yeah. Yes, not in the previous work. Yeah, yeah no, 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 no. And the, the question here is why are the density and color fields, why do they not have floaters? Because floaters are kind of intrinsic to the problem. It's something about f functional representations. Um. So I don't, I don't know for sure. I suspect that um, so, so one thing is, it's, it's, and that, that's a hypothesis, is that when you generate a nerve rather than optimize it per scene, that may be some kind of meta smoothness which makes floaters less likely because it's a lot of hassle for the, for the transformer to generate a nerve which will have floaters. That's, it's, a, it's a lot of hand waving. Um, that's one con conjecture. Another one is that I do think that some, not all, of, not all nerve models are created equal. I think that triplanar models, but some others too, do have less tendency to have floaters. Um, I think, um, but I don't think it's completely understood. We actually have some work looking into why this, what, can, what can be done in general to reduce floaters. But uh, yeah, I don't think, that's, that's the hunches. I don't think I have a better answer. Uh, yeah, one quick question. Um, regarding the work on score Jacobian chaining, um, what's the relationship to dream fusion and why does yep. dream fusion have there is, this there is a, problem? Right. For the, in the CVPR papers, there's a whole paragraph on the relationship to dream fusion. It's concurrent work. They have essentially the same, almost the same algorithm, I think, or around the same. They arrive at it from different directions mathematically. As we think ours is less of a hack, but in the end, you know, in other matters. But it's very similar. Um, and the results you see in Dream Fusion paper, of course, are, are with a much more powerful diffusion model than ours. I think that's maybe what accounts for difference in results. I guess in the second part of my question is, you seem to state that your results don't have that Janus problem, but there's, there was follow-up work that showed that they have quite a bit of an issue in that. So I'm, I'm wondering, is there something else that's different? That Unclear to me. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the thanks for the great talk. We're going to have our next speaker.